it's interesting reading some of the comments and actually reading the article itself. Uh-huh. Um, but for for whatever reason that I, I, I mean it's ever so hard to know where to start because there are so many aspects to it because it's a total um, reimagining of the system that's going on at the moment under cover of the response to a <laughs> Omicron. A, 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 <laughs> Well, before yeah. that, though, but but as a response to a potential pandemic, OK, yeah. yeah, there's a complete reimagining of the system going on. And I think Ardhar is key to that. And so obviously um, Richard's comment on Ardhar, I, I mean, it is absolutely correct. Of course, it will force people into into that. Um, but going deeper into it, um and previous reimaginings oh right okay okay this is richard's interview on the um the last american vagabond that's interesting because this the, the the one i was studying was the one that he did with uh hugh uh hugh hendry on the same channel. Um, but this one is August 2021 and, and the one with Hugh Hendry was. Uh, now, hold on a second. I'm getting myself confused. Right, OK, yeah. But anyway, outside of all of that, OK, obviously Richard is looking at credit creation and reimagining how you allocate stuff in an economy, OK? Uh -huh. um, and how that allocation works, right, is obviously interest rates at a local level and in terms of in exchange rates at an international level okay what's the reference point so gold standard fiat dollar standard what does the fiat dollar standard actually mean and what i i i think there's a sort of a buy oilism i'm calling it whereby the swing production of oil um provides the means by which to uh, control access to swing production through the petrodollar and that will become the carbon thing and so I've had a deeper look into peak oil and I've been doing that for a couple of years uh, meanwhile Julian Assange the extradition is there and what's the significance of Julian Assange and WikiLeaks <clears throat> and what I say is is the significance is it allows a wider body of people to have access to raw data raw, raw <coughs> higher level knowledge etc um, and WikiLeaks and crypto before it were examples of how that could actually be done and so the open source internet is a way of doing that open source research of course i mean the greatest uh, bastardization of open source uh journalism is bellingcat you know so uh if it's in the interests of the power structure it will be supported if it's critical of it or challenging it or has got alternative ideas uh, then obviously it gets put on the naughty step um so there are a lot of themes going through all of this 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 stuff um but a, a huge theme is that was there a financial crash 
ahead of the response to the pandemic was the uh, you know people are sort of saying oh well the the pandemic caused all of that stuff right whereas actually it's masked all of that stuff by one line of argument okay so uh, if effectively you need to hold up all the pieces and 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 then reason out right okay how plausible is that explanation how plausible is that explanation what part of that explanation is improving this plausible explanation you know what what you subtract from one to add to the other and where you eventually get to it's it, it's a messy process okay and it's a messy process which ain't gonna happen on twitter and it certainly won't happen on social media in the determined internet and when i say you know the determined internet i mean the one the the the, the consumer of the internet that submits wholly to uh, the google algorithm um or the state monopoly internet uh, algorithms um they're not going to be getting pieces that will help them to come up with different solutions even identify questions about real problems which the narrative production doesn't want people to mess up their story with an un in, you know with inconvenient <coughs> facts sure so all of that is going on and and so what points of reference do you take to come to some sort of coherent way forward um anyway i i found two very very good summings up if you like of the whole farrago as it were um on a website called the burning platform okay and the guy that writes the pla burning platform used to write quite regularly on seeking alpha which is an investment website that i've been reading for a long time seeking alpha tends to um look at uh a lot of energy type investments that, that's why i've always followed it but this guy stopped writing there in 2011 because basically he was um, going against the dominant narratives. OK, and he wrote two articles which he references in these articles about the current time. So May 31st, 2021 is part one of a blog called There Are No Solutions. And my blog today is basically uh, taking the, you know, the, the, the sort of, um, you know, the trail of breadcrumbs or the, you know, Ariadne's ball of string sort of thing uh, through uh, the themes that this guy, the guy that writes the blog, he, his name is actually James Quinn. Um, and so he references an article that he wrote back in 2008 called The US Economy. There are no problems, only solutions. Um, and now, obviously, th there are no solutions, he's saying. And then part two of that blog, uh, which is June the 1st, 2021, is there are no solutions part two, right? So reading his threaded arguments are interesting to me because he does have an interest in the theory of peak oil, OK? Now, I equate the theory of peak oil with with a theory of peak debt and and peak foreign exchange controls. OK, um, and uh, I also equate it with the the idea of carbon credits and replacing the petro standard dollar standard with the carbon credit standard. Um, and this trend, this this supposed transition from oil to uh, renewables, as they're called, 
or alternative, um, uh, is uh, it's pretty fanciful. I mean, the, the current um, the current graph of of uh, energy production uh, is on the International Energy Agency website, which he references back in his 2011 peak oil um, stuff. Uh, and oil and coal make up about two thirds. Uh, oil, coal and natural gas between them make up probably three quarters of all energy used. Um, biofuel and waste makes up about 10 percent. Uh, what we call uh, so, so wind and solar is is probably something like two percent. Yeah. Uh, and, and so and then there's nuclear and, and nuclear makes up about I was, it looks like about four percent or something like that. Looking at this this graph. Um, now, the interesting thing about peak oil is that the amount of oil uh, being used is is an upward curve. Uh, uh, it, it is an upward curve from 1990 to 2018. Um, the amount of energy supply provided by by oil has gone up, right? So it, it hasn't been going down, which is interesting. And coal has been going up, natural gas. They've all been going up. Of course, population's expanded and energy demand has, has increased. Um, but when I look at this thing, peak oil doesn't speak to me from this. But what does speak to me is the ability to produce um, energy required above the base demand. You know, we talked about electricity grids the other day. Um, and I think that's a really important point. Now, sorry, do you, wanted, when, you say, when you say when you say that's a really important point, do you mean at discretion being able to adjust the amount of electricity that you have access to because of a change in demand? That, that's right. OK. OK. But I just what, wonder. OK. Yeah. What, what I'm arguing, OK, is the petrodollar standard, the petrodollar fiat standard, OK, um, is a de facto sort of a gold standard. And gold standards are deflationary. The way you the way gold didn't uh, periods when gold wasn't deflationary was when you had something called bimetallism. OK, and that's that's when you had uh, basically Sil silver, silver currency uh, and yeah. gold as a store of wealth. OK, that, you know, in a nutshell. You know, that, okay. that, that. Um, now, it's it's quite a subtle point, to, but but when you look at um, right, the, the the Saudis with their huge oil reserves have traditionally acted as a swing producer of oil when when uh, that, that that's basically their job the the swing production of oil transferred to the USA and, 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 and in the latest IEA report it's quite clear that um, US production at, at say around $80 a barrel fracking makes sense and tar sands whatever and the USA is able to uh, or, or is competing with Saudi as the as the swing producer. Right. Um, and that uh, obviously challenging that hegemony or that newfound independence is, is obviously Russian oil production. Um, and famously, Russia has uh, an underdeveloped oil um, industry because it wasn't exploited as it might have been for the whole period up to 1990, obviously, when they had the Soviet system. OK, so it's quite a complicated dynamic going on there. Um, and there's, there's a whole bunch of energy economics that I could go into, but, but which I won't because it uh, I mean, I have done. And if anyone was interested, they go. go they can go and see my analysis of, 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 of how these things hang together. Um, but the. The point.
point about oil is not the availability of oil in itself. There's there's loads of the stuff, okay, but it's actually uh, denying your competitors access to it or denying access to the influence on client users of oil uh, to other suppliers. OK, so this is it's like a sphere of influence argument. Um, and so it also brings in the natural gas debate, the pipelines debates. Why is Syria under so much attack? Why was Libya attacked? Why is Venezuela on the naughty step? How, uh, you know, the, the, the Ukraine situation at the moment, uh, Nord Stream, Russian gas, Germany, uh, all of this stuff is, is all wrapped up into this big equation of what's going on at the moment. And then another huge part of it is right okay it is the financial system as an entity in of, of itself okay uh, and so the derivatives markets the the casino capitalism so this is the non-productive bank games so in in richard verner's disaggregated theory of credit what he does is he says right okay you have um wealth creating stuff in the economy so that's uh, creation of credit for productive purposes. And, and then there's uh, creation of credit for non GDP or unproductive purposes, which is buying speculating basically on existing assets and, you know, bets about what's going to happen to the prices of those assets. Okay. Um, and so you see this is this is my beef with 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 tim morgan and, and his surplus energy economics is that uh he's reduced his analysis down to the energy uh, basically what's called eroi which is energy returned on energy invested okay um and and he says well because uh it's taking more energy to get extra units of energy then there's less surplus energy and it's from the surplus energy that the that, that prosperity is created um and what i say to him is that but but for your analysis to work you've got to strip out basically the the the, the unproductive uses of energy uh and the distortions that can uh, uh, create when you analyze the energy cost of energy in reference to an economic currency unit instead of an economic energy unit. OK, and so his analysis, I, 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 I argued to him and it really pissed him off, um, is flawed because that has to be stripped out. And he kind of claims that he has, but he hasn't. OK, um, and 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 um, what well, is he uh, advocating? Is he advocating a type of energy currency which uh, in some way is not being measured properly. Well, I think the thing is, is, is that. Um, his his whole analysis has been seized on by uh, carbon dioxide catastrophists uh, and, 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 and uh, um, because of that. I think it's 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 lost the objectivity that it had in, in, in the first instance. OK, that that's my my criticism. Of it. Um, and. I, as I say, I mean, I'm still going through this and I'm still getting to the final point. I mean, I'm getting closer and closer and my blog today goes through this thread. Um, the the. At its heart is uh, the ruling establishment. OK, really don't want to let go the power. That's why I like your ba Bateson video with David Graeber and your, you know, that video. That I, um, oh, OK, uh, yeah, the, the slide you've got for the for the thumbnail of it is, is perfect. Mm. OK, and so my argument is 
is is that um of course the central banks and the parts of the state that understand that uh you know the the, the old aphorism that you know give me control of a uh a nation's currency all that stuff um it it, it doesn't matter who makes the laws you know if you control the currency and and that's really what it is and a currency based on debt provides a huge amount of social societal control uh which um is it, it it's almost invisible um in the sense that uh this is this is the invisible hand you know um so uh, and again adam smith's invisible hand um it, it is not as it's written about by the adam smith institute okay i mean uh, adam smith was a lot cleverer than the people at the adam smith institute put it that way uh you know don't forget he's a moral philosopher um and and uh, his views on economics came with actually uh, a very strong ethical um grounding so i as i say ranger the the thing is the themes are so wide um that it takes a long time to go to go through it and so of course when i look at this uh James Quinn's analysis. The good thing about it is that it is over a, a long period of time. He's been paying attention for a long time, um, as of course as Richard Verner. And uh, but paying attention across several disciplines. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's you know it, it's absolutely essential. You you need polymaths for this. You need. Um, uh, you need people that uh, are accessing critical thinking across several fields. Because, you know, sometimes because without yeah. it, you don't stand a chance. Well, in some senses, some of the themes that we've touched on today, uh, education and control. And I remember that. I remember that time about three or four weeks ago, when I looked up that World Economic Forum talk, not on purpose, but it came up, of Anshu Chain and Nilesh Nilankani. Uh, Nilankani, who's in charge of Adha, or at mm -hmm. least is the guy from Infosys. And one of the things they both really said that they wanted to get into was the idea of lifelong learning. Anshu Jain is now at uh, Cantor Fitzgerald, chairman. Mm -hmm. but, um, but they were talking about lifelong learning and then I went onto the Infosys YouTube channel and I saw they partnered with Brent, which is where I grew up. The council. Brent Council, yeah. Yeah, they've partnered with them uh, to do something called Springboard, which looks like LinkedIn to me, as in LinkedIn Learning, what used to be called Linda. LinkedIn Learning, all of that stuff mm. uh, about teaching people skills. So yeah, no, I'm just I'm just saying because you know, this, you know how is you the, this is the important thing that we were we touched upon the other day about the difference between a right answer and correct answers. Mm. Um, I, I, and again, I, I came across something yesterday actually in a a, a, a William Blake thing, um, uh -huh. which, which I put in a blog yesterday. Uh, where he talks about a school in Golden Lane, which used to teach people to make things and then turned into a factory where it was using people that they're supposed to learn how to make. It's, it's just a variation on teach a man to fish as opposed to give yeah. a man a fish. Sure. Uh, a, a bit like that in reverse, which 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 struck me as uh, you know, very relevant. Uh, and, and so lifelong indoctrination um it, 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 it is quite a difference to life lifelong education or lifelong learning as lifelong learning to obey it, it's a different it's a it's a different emphasis and of course the fascist emphasis um which, which you know it, 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 it is the concern of most of these um the 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 these these current uh, the current crew of the ship of fools that are running the show. Okay, uh, 
you know, are, are basically steering a fascist ship. I mean, that's what they're doing. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, state monopoly capitalism, state, you know, it's crony cap, all of that stuff. Um, like I say, I mean, I, 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 the depths of contempt for these people, you know, are unplumbable. I mean, they're, they're just, it's endless. Um, sure, so, I, just, I, just, I, just, I just put that in because you were, you'd been saying how you'd been looking at energy, the economy, control, whether that's through crisis and the vaccine, but also what they would have done anyway. And then afterwards, how difficult it is to keep an eye on the whole thing. Yeah, well, like I say, I mean, I, I can't put it better than 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 James Quinn's two articles on the burning flat platform. I think the American vagabond, last American vagabond, the the the, the, the interviews on there with Richard Verne are very good. Uh, Richard Verne's interview with uh, Hugh Hendry, again, very good. I mean, Richard's academic work has had a massive influence on my own analysis of these things. Um, and, you know, Steve Keen has had a, a, an influence up to a point. But for me, Steve Keen has lost the plot. You know, he's he, he's done a John McDonnell, you know, and he's dedicating the rest of his life to climate change which is just a heap of bullshit, basically. Um, and... Uh, and Pettifor, Daniela Gabor. I think, I think um, I can sort of understand one aspect of it, which is where, and when I say sort of understand, that doesn't mean agree, yeah. Well, Richard uh, gets it. There's a whole, um, the, the difference between uh, pollution and environmental I'm not talking, disembowelment yeah, yeah. is a totally different question to this bogus idea about a control knob for Earth's temperature. It, 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 it's a nutty idea. OK, there was um, uh, there was some some book that I read. I can't remember what it was. Uh, it might have been a history of the Royal Society and they talked about Hook and Newton and how someone, okay, from, yeah. someone from yeah. France came over to commit, you know, to commit, you know, to, to look at this to report back to France about how it all works. And what they said was that in England, when it came to one particular scientific thing, lines were drawn. But whatever side you took for that one scientific issue, Roger, you then stayed on that side for all political stuff. So it was where the culture war and the science just become the same thing. And it's sort of like the court of the king in politics and stuff like that. And I think there's a lot of that going on, you know, so with the Venn diagrams, people are not treating these as separate issues. They're treating everything as the same, which is why you and I find it a lot easier to interact <laughs> than I do with most other people. And I don't know. I mean, I noticed that you like talking to me. So, you know, we're able to do that. But the thing is that, um, yeah, so basically when I spoke to Anne Pettifor a couple of years ago, I told you I'm out with her for a coffee. Um, she didn't say that she was anti-Brexit. What she said was, this is a right-wing project. So, you know, that's roughly the same as what I thought. But at the same time, uh, for her, it's because it was a right-wing project. That's why she wasn't interested in it. Not because of Brexit itself. You know, if you look at it on its own. Yeah. And so that was funny. And so she pointed it. And so that, what the problem I have with that is then you have her, Daniel Alicapo, all these other people who, you know, are obviously on the surface, at least from what I come across, you know, pleasant individuals, smart, you know, they have to be careful about what, what who they speak to and bloody blah, blah. But that's how this thing happens. And it's for, for me, it's a kind of self-censorship intellectually as well, where it means that all conversation is banned because everyone starts, as you say, doing raspberries. So... I think Keen is in the same camp. These are all the types of people who I either interviewed or we wanted to interview um, back then. And it was easier in 2017. But now, you know, to say, hi, can we talk about these things? The answers, I wonder what they would be. I think they'd be um, a bit pissed off about being asked. I don't know, Ranjan. I mean, I, 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 I don't know. I, I, I think that 
the whole idea of left, right or far right and um, far left uh, are, 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 you know, are just bogus. Um, you know, we know what they mean. We know where they gain their sort of appellation from, as it were. But yeah, how, but Piers how, how, yeah. how uh, I mean, I read something this morning, uh, which, uh, uh, you know, basically talking about how, um, you know, what you do is you have two political parties that on the face of it look left or right. But what they really do is you can vote one lot out or another lot in and they carry on regardless. But yeah, they do feel, what you want because you've got the money. Yeah, exactly. So um, and so when people seek to shoehorn stuff they agree with into a left or a right oh, and stuff they don't in, in, in the opposite polarity, um, I, it's it's not a good way, actually, of, 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 of uh, coming up with answers to what's in front of you. You know, it. it, it it, it well, it leads you know, it leads to uh, sham reasoning, as as CSP is used to call it. So, I it leads to what? Sham reasoning. It's a, there's a made up quote in in a thing called We Pragmatists, uh, which is uh, a, a, an imaginary conversation between I think she's called Susan Hack. She's an American pragmatist philosopher. Uh, Richard Rorty, who was also one, and C.S. Pierce, who is kind of the he's the father of American pragmatism. He was friends with William James and and, and uh, a huge influence on him. Most people come to American pragmatism from James onwards, where, whereas C.S. Pierce is is uh, he 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 was a famous logician, mathematician. Yeah, just yeah. Math. No, I know of him. I know of him. Yeah. I've got some of his stuff. I haven't really read it. I know that mm. you know I've seen him, mentioned him as well as you. So. Um, the point about Julian Assange, OK, and, you know, looking at the the the, the off Guardian article about it, OK, um, is what's happening to him is absolutely outrageous. It, it's a massive, massive clue to quite how depraved both the British and the US justice systems in inverted commons have become. OK, it's a depravity. End of story. OK, it's an abuse of process and a huge abuse of power. It just is. Um, it, it, it contravenes just about every tenant of common law, of natural law, of equity, of justice, of all the stuff which, you know, it, it, it makes the law an ass is what it does. Um, why, why is it so important to make an example of this individual? Because at the end of the day, he's an individual, he's a brilliant individual. But he has his flaws, you know. I, 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 I um, sure. I, I, you know, yeah. he'd be an interesting guy to have a cup of coffee with. But I, you know, um, but judging by his moves on the Swedish dance floor when he was over here, um, you know, I, 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 you know, a night out, you know, I, I, he, he, he lacks the funk rhythm and natural kind of. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's, you see what I mean? Like a, a full on night out. No, thank you. But, you know, but but respect props, all the rest of it. But he's, you know, he's he's not my kind of guy. It, it, you know, do you see what I mean? Um, mm, but yeah, yeah, yeah. that's not to say he's not absolutely brilliant. He is. Uh, and the body of his work um, outside of WikiLeaks is considerable in my opinion um, and his influence and his threat to the established order is to do with his his 
his key role as a sort of a flux to the internet discourse, right? Um, so, you know, a flux is like a, um, it's like an amplifier. It, it amplifies a chemical process is what a flux does. Yeah. Um, and so the existence of a WikiLeaks mentality and the sort of intellect of Julian Assange, which is inquiring, challenging, uh, you know, sometimes obnoxious, um, but uh, unfiltered. OK. It doesn't only provoke reaction it, 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 it inspires or or, or or challenge you know it it it, it, it you, you can't ignore it yeah you might not like it but you ain't going to ignore it because it's it, it is compelling and it's well argued it's thought through and he knows his onions um and i think that three-hour interview with 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 uh, Eric Schmidt, what, what it actually showed and, and what he was actually saying himself is that it had it inspired a lot of people. Yeah, so it was, uh, you know, it, it's like an example. Um, and. It's an example similar to uh, what Noam Chomsky used to say about socialist revolutions in South America. You can't have the danger of a good example. You know, it, it, you know, it, mm. it, uh, you know, it's Carthage must be destroyed is 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 the, you know, is the thing. It, it's an alternative thing. And, and we've, you know, it, 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 it it's it's a sort of iconic I, iconoclism, you know, I got, you know, iconoclasts outside. Um, no, what it is, is that. You know when a new regime comes in and then it tries to destroy the old regime or get rid of any inconvenient ideas yeah um it, it, it it's an it, it, it's the ultimate act of iconoclasm against an individual and 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 a movement around that in, individual that they're they're a part of but seen as a as a catalyst or a um a flux for for other people it's contagious you know julian okay. assange he's actually it's a virus you know and that's the virus they're really scared about that they, they, they're afraid of the virus of contagious ideas or contagious critical thought do you see what i mean so mm. uh and so What what's interesting to me is that they seem so um, they seem so indifferent to the likelihood that they could have or, or, or the potential that they could end up with a martyr on their hands. You know, because you know, if if you if you're attempting some sort of iconoclasm, um, you know, the antidote to iconoclasm is martyrs. You know, a, a martyrs live forever. So, um, you know, if they if these were sensible people, they would have let him go already because they've 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 demonstrated their point. It will put, you know, the maximum number of people that would be put off by that kind of authoritarian um, jackboot will have already been put off. So they've, you know, I think they've had, you know, we've had peak Assange effect. And so it's just, you know, it, 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 it serves no purpose and it would serve their purpose um, in terms of deflating that particular tire, if you will, to just let him go. The fact that they're not able to. It seems to me, it, 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 I mean, it's just another part of the new absurdism. Yeah, I suppose so. I mean, I think, I think the vindictiveness. Well, you see, there's that, there's nothing that Julian can do that lots of other people can't do. That that's the point, and this is perhaps what they don't understand. These people, they they, I think they believe so much in their own irreplaceability that they see their enemies as perhaps the best that that we have. 
and you know um uh <laughs> you know one individual in any population you know it, it, it's absurd to think they're the best that there is in all fields and all the rest of it uh, so i can think of you know there are lots of people um who are doing all the stuff that julian assange is known for having done and no one's ever heard of them uh you know it, it, it's um I, I, I mean, what's coming into my mind at the moment is, 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 is John F. Kennedy quoting Xerxes, you know, the, 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 the passion for freedom dieth not. Um, and the passion for freedom would not die with the martyrdom of Julian Assange. No. Uh, but, you know, I mean, I, I mean, I am concerned. I mean, you know, at a basic human empathetic level, you know, seeing someone made to suffer like that really pisses me off. Whether I like him or not, it pisses me off. It shouldn't, you know, it's just not on. You know, that's the great British, well, steady on. That's 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 not OK. You know, that's just not on. Mm. Oh, boy. You know, it's just it's that simple. Yeah, they've taken it too far. Well, they've taken it further than is actually in their own best interest as well, which 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 is intriguing. Well, it's a sign of, of an insane, an insane pathology, isn't it? Yeah, I've heard of. Um, when you probably you might know about this um, with the suffragettes. Mm -hmm. They put they put them in jail. And. I can't remember whether there was some law that was being passed, but the other name for the law, the colloquial name for the law, was the cat and the mouse law. And I think it might have been linked to when you're in prison, if you're a suffragette protester, then they force feed you to stop you from dying. Mm -hmm. And um, so that way you don't become a martyr. Yeah. But, yeah, as, but as you say, but as you say, what a they more modern. What they a, a, a more modern example of that were, were, were the H blocks, but of course Bobby Sands did did die in his hunger strike. Uh, okay, well, but as well as feeling what, what they called it, the cat and mouse bill, because um, uh, they they, be, they began to realise that the people in prison had more power when they were in prison than when they were out. Which is what you were saying. Well, yeah, they haven't got more freedom, and it, you know, no, I, I, no, you know, no, no. I, I mean, none of us are free as long as Julian Assange is in prison. I mean, there are lots of other people in prison that shouldn't be there. That's absolutely true as well. Um, but uh, so here's another one. I tell you, interesting. This I, I had a long chat with David Malone yesterday, and uh, we were chatting away about what we were talking about earlier on in this conversation um, uh, and uh, uh, I, I was talking to him about a, a blog he wrote some time ago called e e ETFs uh, you know a warning from history is basically saying that mm. e EDFs were the new credit um, uh, cr uh, uh, CDOs um, yeah. uh, debt obligations whatever um, now mm. the the and I, I was saying to him about how in going direct and Blackstone's implementation of that, there is on the web a list of the ETFs that they've been bailing out. So David was absolutely right about that. Was uh, that on the, Bank of, on the Bank of England, did you say? No, it's not the Bank of England. I mean, it's uh, it, I, I was looking at it the other. I'll find it and send you a link. There's a PDF on the on the Internet, which I, I mean, I've probably put, got it on my hard drive somewhere. Um, huh. But I mean, when I saw it, I thought, oh, right, there we are. David's right again. Um, but what, what we were talking about and he was sort of saying about. They're going to. Start going on about mining asteroids and doing all this, that and the other. Um, and. 
I, I said, well, look, you know, maybe they are, but it's nuts. Um, and he and he agreed me it didn't matter that it was nuts. And I said, well, it's, it's also a complete waste of resources. You know, they, they you know, let, sort things out down here. Eh? How about that? You know, it, it, it's like the height of hubris. And it, uh, I think what it tells us about the, the current um, the, the current command structure of the ship of fools that we call the, you know, this, the, the, you know, the corporate state um, is that they not only believe their own bullshit, but believe some pretty far-fetched science fiction shit as well um and uh so w we had a chat about that and I I I, I I I i said well actually i think we're you know i i'm tend more to what did you say richard said about ardha forcing people into ardha if you get rid of i i think that's yeah, what it's all about demonetization yeah so i i don't think that um justifying the existing financial system is the point they're they're, they're going to try and lock us into uh, I, I mean i said it, it's sort of like a feudal script you know script was the um uh, script as i mean it is in the in, in the way of of, of, of tennessee uh, ernie ford and the famous song 16 tons i work 16 tons and what do i get another day older and deeper in debt and and you know I, I owe my soul to the company store is is the chorus uh and that's company script colonial script was kind of the greenback it's when the colonialists it, it all kicked off between king george and the u.s colonists when king george got pissed off with them using colonial script so colonial script was uh, a, a precursor to the greenback, okay? And the greenback was the uh, currency that Lincoln used in the Civil War in the US, right? Uh, an analog to it in Britain would be the Bradbury Pound, um, which was post First World War or during the First World War. Um, so what is this idea of company script? Well, let's call it corporate script. Hey, we could even call it universal basic income. Now, universal base, basic income, you know, I've been critical of John McDonald and Guy Standing on their take on it. Um, and mm. people like Anne Pettifor, because they believe it's it's based around redistributive taxation. There's a brilliant article that was written about She's against the, basic income. You know that. Well, you know, let, she, let me make my point first. I mean, I don't know. Sorry. Let me make my point Sorry. first, because um, the, 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 the point is um, that uh, in Switzerland, they had a referendum on universal basic income and the narrative about it was that, well, how do we afford it? It has to come from tax where actually, no, it can come from uh, credit creation and credit creation for useful purposes, um, and mental health, all that sort of thing. Um, but uh, a universal citizen's dividend is a different thing to a universal basic income with strings attached. An income suggests a an employer, right? And so then this then comes down to the whole question of wage slavery. And wage slavery, taxation, taxation for government revenue, that idea is a very Calvinistic 19th century idea. It just is. Um, and so a group of the, the group of people like Steve Keen, like Richard Murphy, like uh, Anne Pettifor, uh, they basically uh, are they're technocrats in their own right. With a with a more sort of with a sort of a, a patrician, almost um, oh what would be the word a Prussian approach to you know um, you know patting the serfs on the head. So that 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 talk between Pettifor, Chomsky, and Varoufakis. Varoufakis actually says at one point rural idiocy. He's like talking you know he's basically talking about 
you know, rural people, country bumpkins like me, if you like, um, you know, he, he equates that sort of, you know, sons of the soil like me with idiocy. Mm. Uh, so the, the, the best example of that is um, Jude the Obscure, the Hardy novel. Um, brilliant novel. Do, do you know it? I don't. I've heard of it, but I don't know at all. Yeah. So, but but that 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 speaks to that sort of snobbery. Oh, okay. And it is it is yeah, snobbery. It's it's not just intellectual snobbery. It's also class based snobbery. Um, you know. So, but anyway, I mean, he said that, and I was throwing things at my computer screen. You know, it quite pissed me off. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, you were saying Anne Pettifor is against the universal basic income. Well, she told, yeah, she, well, she told me a few years ago that she was against it because she's a socialist. And so therefore socialists they believe in people being able to have work. You know, you know, well, so, being, so, well, this is the MNT point about a job guarantee. But like I say, that's that, that, that's a devil. The devil makes uh, work for idle hands. Which then brings me to to to, to this um, the John Lennon song, which, which, which this guy uh, this 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 thing says uh, right okay U.S. economy there are no problems only solutions okay it's a quote from John Lennon's song called Watching the Wheels um, and one of the lines in that is, is, is people call me lazy because I'm sort of sat here watching the, the wheels or whatever. Brilliant song. Absolutely perfect. And it, it speaks to that sort of uh, really condescending, um, you know, the, the people must be kept poor so they remain obedient. And again, it, it's a it, 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 it's a it is an intellectual snobbery class thing. You know, I'm sure that Anne Pettifor is a very nice lady and all the rest of it, but she can take a patronage and shove it where the fucking sun don't shine. That's what it is. It's patronising. What, wanting people to be able to have jobs? No, that's not. The, look, the, the point is, right, that in the current state of technology, we should be having more leisure. OK, people should be working less hard. OK, Um and so if we're going to have AI, we're going to have robots and all the rest of it, then people should be able to uh, express their own creativity. Right. And so it's a it's a, it's a top down uh, commissar's approach to socialism is, is what it is. Right. Now, of course, pe people will work or create value. And, uh, you know, people do all of that. So David Graeber used to go on about all of this stuff all the time, you <clears> know, <throat> with his, his his book, Bullshit Jobs, you know. So it, it, it's two sides of the Magnus Mills novel, the, the scheme for full employment. It shows the the complete fallacious basis of that argument. Because it, what it presumes is that if you don't have a job, you're going to starve. Well, people shouldn't starve if they don't have a job. A citizen's dividend, OK, is in full recognition of the fact that, um, you know, everyone has a right to be here and that w what we call society, what we call civilization is built upon uh, other ancestors giving up stuff like the enclosures and things like that. So it, it, it starts its reasoning at a point uh, which utterly misses, you know, um, well, basically, um, Marx talked about primitive accumulation. Yeah. Um, and, and he's right about primitive accumulation. You know, it's kind of I've got the biggest army or I've got the biggest gun or I'm a bigger psychopath than your psychopath. So I'm going to nick your land. That's what the enclosures was. Now, because that took place and allowed capital accumulation, right, out of that came this, I, you know, the thing, well, if, if, if you didn't take on wage slavery, um, you would starve. Well, 
the alternative to a job guarantee is not a, a polar uh, 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 response. It, it, it's apples and pears. Effectively, what you're saying is people have the right to a citizen's thing. So the, the famous crass song, do you think they, you know, do you think they owe us a living? Of course they fucking do. Of course they fucking do. That's the answer to Anne Pettifor on, you know, mm. when all the analysis is said and done, right? Um, and that kind of Georgism, you know, Henry George, single land value tax, all the rest of it, his economics, distributism, all the all the Chester Belloc stuff. OK, it, it's a it's it's an unpatronizing, unpatronizing uh, uh, response to to the problem. And I'm afraid Anne's response and the MMT crowd's response is is Stalinist. It's uh, it's condescending. Uh, and it, it's based on a deep seated intellectual and class based snobbery, frankly. Just mm. is. I mean, you know, there's no getting away from it. It doesn't stand up. So where do you think we're where, where do you think we're headed now? I mean, I don't mean with the current government or anything like that, but um, it's quite easy to see elements, as we've discussed. Well, well my view, the I, I, I still have hope in the Internet and the discourse being sufficiently wide um, uh, that. Right, OK. Um, in David's documentary, Why Are We Here? There's an episode with Martin Nowak and he's got a biological mo model talking about um, super cooperators and predators and the model and, and that the super cooperators is a constant. It's, was it 10 to the log eight or something, which is basically the mathematical constant and super co cooperators in any system are that universal constant and the censorship disruptions and the jackboot if you like tries to keep those super cooperators apart i've sensed this several times and i i think um in the run-up to 2016 uh the super cooperators had kind of managed to find each other and formed their their protective groups and I think that formation is actually happening and has been happening in the last several months. OK, but the disruption at the beginning of the pandemic and all of these uh, predatory state monopoly capitalist actions, OK, have kind of dispersed, dispersed people again. But you see the internet is not powerful enough to uh disrupt the social instincts and the cooperative instincts of the humans as a social being okay and this is what the current crew of the ship of fools don't understand because they are a cacistocracy they're not the brightest and best they just not OK, in some cases, they're learned ignorant agencies, but by and large, they're just fucking morons. That's the point. Now. Um, you see, the thing about super cooperators, OK, you know, you put like m people like me on the outside of a group of super cooperators and I'll go and duff these cunts up. Right. That's my job. Right. Probably the job of people like John Hendry or whatever. But it's our job to look after the clever ones like you and like um, Richard Verner and all the rest of it and to shut up and listen when people have got something sensible to say. But if, if, if there's some twat that needs a punch on the nose, then, you know, you've got to let them have it if they're asking for it. Mm. But, but meanwhile, that conversation, I, 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 I I, I can see that conversation coming together and I, I, I can see it through my own 
sources and 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 and, and i i can see the groups of super cooperators and 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 people have choices as to which which of those groups they feel more comfortable within and that that is a national that is a natural process which martin nowak has, has has basically studied scientifically and and unlike the the moron uh people who who, who are using sham reasoning Martin Noah, he's he, yeah, he's got a computer model that actually works because he's a proper scientist. So that's what I think is happening. Um, and uh, you know, I, I, unfortunately, you know, an idiot with access to the sheep sweet shop can cause a lot of damage. And, and we have got idiots and they are causing a lot of damage and they are trying to invent a system that simply won't work. Um, but, you know, uh, the rest of us, I don't think really need to worry about that too much because, you know, they're, they're basically they'll, 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 they'll blow out on their own hot air. You know, that, that's that's my view. Yeah, well, I'm I'm also hopeful that conversations, if they're able to keep going, that I mean, I was I was so impressed to see uh, what Richard was doing and saying, but also knowing that what he's doing and saying is being said by other people. So it doesn't mean that he starts it, but it means that everyone is not everyone, but people are keeping up with him. Uh, yeah, because you know, um, he's he's good. He's good at that. R R R Richard has, you know, he 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 stood the. I mean, I I I had a wonderful lunch with him. We 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 went to the Ivy in Winchester. Um, I think it was. It may. I'm not sure if it was this. It was earlier this summer, I think, rather than last summer. I'm pretty sure. Um, anyway, and we had a wander around Winchester, and then we went to the Ivy and we had lunch. And he ordered tempura prawns because he said they reminded him of of of, of, of Japan and you know Japan. Uh, you know we, we had a really nice lunch and a, and a really good chat you know um, about you know about different things and uh, you know and obviously I've talked to him on the phone quite a few times since I haven't spoken to him in the last few weeks I've sent him a couple of messages. Um, but I mean, obviously, I mean, it, you only realise how bloody busy he is when when you sort of see just the the volume of his output. But put it this way, if you compare his latest appearance, say, on Renegade Economist with um, uh, Ross, what's he called? Ross? Mm, I don't know, but I, I did actually listen <laughs> the, to it yesterday. The, the guy that does that. If you compare yeah. the most recent Richard Werner with the most recent Steve Keen, and you know kind of take your pick I, I you know um uh i you know i i know that who i would employ in my business and who i wouldn't put it that way mm. so yeah i mean it, it, it but it's not just it, it isn't just richard there, there are you know um uh i i think he's out ahead of the curve you know i, I think he's in my view, he's in a class of his own in 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 that field. Um, but what's really encouraging is that it, it it's overlapping with other brilliant people in their fields. Okay, so he was on the uh, COVID as a as a as a financial event. Um, thing uh, which mm. was hosted by UK Column some you know a, a month or two back and, and Taylor Huddock who you mentioned she, she, she introduced that um, and so uh, uh, you know and that overlaps with a number of other you know other people that, that, and another brilliant person that I uh, it, it, it is Dennis Ranacourt who again I don't think Dennis Ranacourt um, is as well known as he should be. Um, uh, you know, I mean, I, I mean, there are there are others. Um, but people are finding each other. 
and you know uh and it's this it, it takes a bit longer for the super cooperators to find each other because there are less of them and the disruptive super predators um are basically holding the uh pinch points in the distribution channels for um communication uh, but as i say they that that dam you know it's like the little dutch boy with his finger in the dam yeah it, they can't hold it off forever uh and there's enough leakage uh around the edges of of of, of these you know concrete barriers that have been put between people and and eventually people find you know people find each other and that that's the super cooperation thing so was it 10 to the minus log 8 or something i i can't whatever it is but martin nowak um why are we here that that interview it's it's on the web the full interview absolutely fascinating um and and uh i, I was talking to david about that yesterday I said, you know um we we're talking about uh his film dangerous knowledge talking about the Wuhan lab leak film that was on Channel 4 that he made. Uh, but I also said that one of my absolute favourites, one of my absolute favourites is that interview with Martin Noah on Why Are We Here? It's absolutely fascinating. Yep. Anyway, Ranjan, I'll let you get off. Blimey, we've been on for over an hour. Um, so are you, are you off on your walkies now? Yeah, um, I'm actually just about to pick some stuff up from a shop, but um, I'll give you a call later if you're around. Cool. Yeah, yeah, I'm around. I'm around. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to get, I mean, the, part of the reason I've been doing all this research is I'm, I'm trying to write my investment strategy for next year of, of what, you know, um, of course, and trying to do that people. in a financial system that's in turmoil is is you know it it, it makes it all the more challenging <laughs> but there we are i can imagine well I'll let you get on with it and um, i'll catch up with you later will do cheers Renjan. take care bye